I haven't made a video in a little while because I haven't really felt inspired to say much that could add to the hundreds of videos on this channel already. But I came across this story featured on Fox Business by a Motley Fool author. It inspired me to take a look at some numbers and see what kind of a story they have to tell. First, I'm going to read the story, and then I'll present what I see as the facts. It goes like this. Millions of Americans rely on Social Security to stay afloat financially in retirement perhaps more than they should. An estimated 25% of seniors 65 and older currently depend upon Social Security as their only form of retirement income, and the program supplies the majority of retirement income to as many as 65% of present beneficiaries. But while today's seniors may have the luxury of collecting their benefits in full, at least for the time being, those eligible for benefits in the future may not be as lucky. For better or worse, working Americans are starting to accept the fact that Social Security may not be the same down the line. According to the latest Transamerica Retirement Survey, 77% of workers are worried that Social Security won't be available to them when it's their turn to retire. The question is, are they right? Let's get one thing straight. Even in a worst-case scenario, future Social Security recipients might see a significant reduction in benefits once it's their turn to collect. But the program is by no means going away in its entirety, at least not as of now, according to the Social Security Board of Trustees' latest report. The program's trust fund is set to run out in 2034, but that doesn't mean that the entire program will run out of money. Social Security is a pay-as-you-go system. Workers are taxed on their incomes, and that money is used to pay beneficiaries. In recent years, more Americans have been retiring than entering the workforce, and if this trend continues, as expected, pretty soon the, account, uh, the amount collected in Social Security taxes won't suffice in keeping up with retiree benefits. That's why the trust fund exists. For years, there was more money coming into Social Security than there was coming out, so that money was used to establish the program's trust fund. When taxes alone can't support benefits, the trust fund can be tapped to pick up the slack. According to current projections, starting in 2019, Social Security will need to fall back on the trust fund to keep up with benefits until the fund runs out of money in 2034. Once that happens, benefits will likely need to be cut unless we come up with another plan for increasing Social Security funding. Still, current projections tell us that future beneficiaries should expect to see about 75% of their benefits, even if the trust fund is completely depleted. Even if Social Security does continue to exist in its present form, it's imperative that Americans take steps to save independently for retirement. Contrary to what so many are led to believe, Social Security isn't and never was designed to serve as a retiree's sole source of income. In fact, for the average American, Social Security can only replace roughly 40% of pre-retirement income. Most of us, however, need a minimum of 70% 70 of what we previously earned to keep us up with living expenses in retirement. Those who expect to travel or have costly health issues to consider probably need even more. Relying too heavily on Social Security is an easy way to set yourself up for failure. Thankfully, younger Americans are finally getting wise to this very fact. According to the latest out of Transamerica, only 17% of millennials expect Social Security to be their primary source of retirement income. Baby boomers, by contrast, are counting on the program way too much, with as many as 34% anticipating that Social Security will provide all the income they need once they stop working. No matter what the future holds for Social Security, your best strategy, actually, is to assume the worst, that it won't be around in a significant fashion once you retire. From there, you should take retirement savings into your own hands, socking away as much as you can as early as you can. If you start saving $300 a month, then uh, when you're 30 years old, and your investments generate an average annual 8% return, <coughs> yeah, right, uh, which is totally realistic for a stock-focused portfolio, you'll have over $620,000 by age 65. But if you wait 10 years to start saving that $300 per month, you'll have just $263,000 when 65 rolls around. That's less than half. <laughs> and the author uses an exclamation point here to explain how important this is. Remember, there's a good chance that you'll see some sort of income out of Social Security 10, 20, or 30 years down the line. 
But no matter how big that benefit check ends up being, there's a good chance it still won't be enough to fund a comfortable retirement. You're much better off forgetting about Social Security and being pleasantly surprised if your benefits come out higher than expected. If you're like most Americans, you're a few years or more behind on your retirement savings, but a handful of little-known quote-unquote Social Security secrets could help ensure a boost in your retirement income. For example, one easy trick could pay you as much as $15,834 more each year once you learn how to maximize your Social Security benefits. We think you could retire confidently with peace of mind uh, that we're all after. And that was the end of the article. Of course, there was a free link supplied that you could click on that would take you to a website designed to get you to buy some advice, but I decided to ignore it. Let's delve a little bit into some real numbers and see what kind of story they tell. We can start with some tax receipt data that I was able to obtain for the years 1945 up to the present. Here I've summarized them in a plot. I left the numbers as nominal figures, which means that they have not been adjusted for the effects of inflation. We won't need to adjust them to learn what we need to learn from them, as you'll see in a few minutes. Just be aware that every 20 years or so, the purchasing power of each dollar is cut in half due to inflation, and so it takes roughly twice the number of dollars to buy the same amount of goods and services. That's something that I've beaten to death on this channel already. The tax categories are broken down into individual income tax, which is something that you are all intimately familiar with, corporate income tax, social, social insurance, ad valorem taxes, and other. Social insurance taxes are basically Social Security and Medicare. Ad valorem taxes are one-time taxes, such as inheritance tax. We don't need to be too concerned about the ad valorem and other categories because, as you can see, they are very small in terms of the percentage of the total. Let's remove them and move on. As we can see, we don't really lose much information by simply focusing on individual income taxes, corporate income taxes, and social insurance taxes. Between the three of them, they account for about $3 trillion worth of revenue that the government receives each year to fund operations. It's a very large number. Just to give you an appreciation of how large a number it is, we can compare it against the U.S. gross domestic product of $18 trillion. The federal government collects about $1 out of every six transacted in the United States, or about 17%. If we included state and local taxes, the percentage of economic activity that's siphoned off by government would be much larger, but we're just going to focus on the federal level in this video. Now, we know for a fact that the government spends more than what they bring in in tax receipts every year. If they didn't, then we wouldn't have a growing national debt. We should make an adjustment to this chart to include the other major source of current funding the government uses to cover its spending, and that is borrowing. On this graph, I've plotted tax receipts in blue on the left axis and the growing U.S. debt in red on the right axis. Our debt is currently projected to pass the $20 trillion mark by the end of the current administration. It's quite a large number, especially when you consider that it was only eight years ago when we had a debt of about $10 trillion. Don't take that as a political statement uh, signaling out our current Democratic president. Our previous Republican president saw the national debt nearly double on his eight-year watch as well. Rather than go by each administration's report of deficit spending, Let's do a true balance sheet account uh, and simply look at the change in the official debt from one year to the next. After all, the accumulated debt is a true account of the sum of real accumulated deficits. Thus, if we want to know how much was borrowed between the year 2009 to the present, we subtract the $10 trillion debt at the end of 2008 from the current $19.4 trillion to come up with $9.4 trillion worth of borrowing. It's as simple as that. We can do that for each and every year from 1945 to the present. And if we add those numbers to the stack, we end up with a graph that looks like this. Now, you'll notice that in the legend, I labeled this borrowing as explicit borrowing. This is the borrowing that is funded by voluntary purchases of treasury bonds by individuals, pension funds, investment trusts, and mutual funds. $9.4 
It's also purchases of treasuries made by foreign central banks to recycle their trade surpluses with the U.S. every year, a subject that I've covered in other videos. And it's also the amount of treasuries that's monetized by our own Federal Reserve Bank, because after all, when the federal government needs to spend money beyond what others are willing to lend, the Federal Reserve has to buy them to avoid having a failed auction. Let's take this one step further. You see that social insurance category? Well, it's different than individual and corporate income tax. After all, when income tax is collected, that's it. There's no further obligation on the part of the government. When social insurance tax is collected, it comes with a promise, an implicit promise, just as the author of the article that I read alluded to. It's not really a simple pay-as-you-go system. Otherwise, they wouldn't have to pretend to have savings in the form of treasury bonds to cover future obligations. Put quite simply, the social insurance tax is a form of implicit borrowing. So, let's call it what it is. There we go. Now we have all of the major sources of funding that the government uses to cover its current spending needs. We have our income taxes, we have explicit borrowing, and we have implicit borrowing. In order to make the trends in the percentages abundantly clear, we should combine the implicit and the explicit funding categories into one big bucket. And voila! We now have a graph that shows trends in the sources of government spending broken down by category. The two categories on the bottom I view as more or less honest because it is simply the government saying to individuals and corporations, we're going to take this money from you, and that's that. The borrowing category on the top I view as more or less dishonest because it comes with the promise of repayment in the future. A promise which I've noted in many of my other videos cannot possibly be honored. It's a mathematical impossibility one which others are gradually picking up on, as the article that I read at the beginning illustrates. As I said before, this data is in nominal dollars, and so inflation is somewhat masking the important trends. I don't think that we need to inflation adjust these numbers to see that the, the real story that the data is telling us. Besides, inflation is always a very subjective measure, and different people will do it differently. So instead, Let's simply plot these categories year by year in terms of the contribution each category makes to the total amount of government spending. And when we do, this is what we get. Look at this graph, give it a moment, and let the horrifying realities sink in. The first thing that you probably noticed is that in the middle of the last century, corporations paid almost as much in income taxes as individuals. Over the past 70 or so years, the percentage paid by individuals hasn't really declined all that much. On the other hand, the percentage paid by corporations has shrunk to be a tiny fraction of what individuals pay. This has been the case since 1980 it's very clear that something very fundamental has shifted in regard to the allocation of the tax burden between workers and the owners of capital. And this is something that has, been, has lasted for many administrations, both Republican and Democrat. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why the funding supplied by corporations to politicians is so incredibly high. Think of what's at stake if the quote-unquote wrong people got into office. The most startling feature of the graph, though, is the steadily increasing chunk of spending that is funded by explicit and implicit borrowing. 60 to 70 years ago, we can see that between the implicit borrowing, namely our social insurance taxes, and explicit borrowing, it only accounted for about 20% of government spending. Our federal, federal government back then levied explicit taxes on individuals and corporations to pay for their spending. That might explain why we hear stories about how back then, people tended to care much more about what the government spent their money on. Of course, that's just speculation on my part. Over the next few decades, we see that a much larger and larger portion of government spending has been funded by borrowing and by collection of taxes earmarked for social insurance programs. In fact, 
Now we can see that more than half of all federal government spending is done with dollars that are essentially borrowed with the promise to pay someone back in the future. The problem with this giant chunk of funding is that eventually the promises come due. With the explicit debt, the bonds have a certain maturity. As they come due, we rely upon our ability to roll them over. In other words, sell new debt to cover the maturing debt. Are we seeing signs now that we're having some trouble rolling the debt over? I think so. Otherwise, we wouldn't need for the Federal Reserve to monetize the debt. We'd have an ample supply of buyers at auction time. With the implicit debt, it comes due when the taxes collected are insufficient to pay the benefits to current retirees. We may be approaching that point now. I, I do know that the Social, Social Security Trust Committee is projecting that they will run out of funds in the quote-unquote trust fund sometime in the next couple decades. But as you and I both know, the funds in the trust fund are just more obligations on the part of the Treasury. They can't be spent. The real ob obligation is coming due now, as the wave of baby boomers crashes over the system, forcing someone to admit the truth. And that truth is that we've all fallen victim to accounting shenanigans.